There we go. So it makes sense to record these things, right? Absolutely. So uh, I'm going to try this past presenter role to you now. Okay. Make sure you got your uh, desktop clean of any crud you want. So you should get some sort of. Yeah, it's telling me to download a desktop app. Yeah. You okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. I had to look download one as well. In the future, I might be using WebEx, but Steve's got a private login password for it, and I wasn't going to ask him for the WebEx one. Right. I've been using WebEx for eight, ten years or something, but they changed the interface recently. When we do things with Postal, it's always WebEx. So when we're troubleshooting a problem with the post office, they're doing the typing, and, and me and somebody else might be coaching them through it. It took me about a minute and a half to download it. Yeah, I've installed it. It's saying connecting now. Sure. There you go. Okay, so you see my desktop? Sandals. I see sandals. Yes. So any, anyways, again, you know, we're, I'm not your boss. You manage your own time. When I throw things at you, that's up to you to decide, right? You get my point? Right. And I wanted Brian to get up to speed on building RPMs and building a GPU DB system from the ground up because that's kind of our bread and butter is the GPU DB stuff. I can kind of read your font, so I'm okay. And again, the uh, operating procedures I started a year ago, roughed them together, and you know, obviously they have a lot of work. We can talk about things as we go along, but at least we now have both edit and comment capabilities so that we can do a collaborative document, right? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. I just I just didn't know how many people were accessing that document. I didn't I didn't want any confusion to come into play there. Well that's fine. O only you and I should be able to edit it and we're the only ones really using it. Okay. But that will be when we've got a procedure like your monet or gang building ganglia from scratch, we can put it straight into a document instead of pass or we might pass email once or twice, but then try to get it in a single place, right? Right. So I'd added monitor and everything. So anyways, let's just log into Sandbox, SSH to Sandbox. And you can tell why I called it Sandbox. It's just a place to mess with. And again, we won't discuss any passwords on a recording, but uh, I give pretty simple ones out there. So when I get to a system, the first thing is I'd like to know what I have. So let's start with DMI decode and pipe it into more. Uh, decode, I think you spelled it wrong. DMI decode, DMI decode, you left an E out. DMI decode. DMI. DMI decode. I think you left an E out last time. Decode now. Yeah, that, that's what I typed. Uh, DMI. Logged... You want me to change my font? See, I don't see an E. I see DMI DC. The font's oh, a little okay. small. For me. Maybe up your font a little. There we go. There. Okay. Up yeah, your I'm, I'm just, I thought I read it right, but this way I we don't have to struggle with it. Just one font up. Appearance. There you go. There you go. Go to twelve point. Go to twelve. Let's see how that works. Yeah, that's fine. So okay. DMI decode is going into the BIOS. 
and you can get different things. Now notice about five lines from the bottom. You got SGI.com in there, so they've modified the BIOS, right? Right. And SGI product name for this box is that C11 blah, 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 mm -hmm. serial number, page on down. Yeah. And uh, chassis. Let's see. No, nope, that's not what I'm looking for. Go down one more. I'm looking for the super micro. Go back up. I think I passed it. I think we're past it. If you can go back. Yeah, the the B is not working for me. Yeah, uh, just quit and do it again. I think more doesn't take it friendly, but. So in there is the actual super micro chassis number. Hang on. Let's see. Uh, where is it? Hang on. I'm going to log in as well. There are options to specify just the pieces that you want. Okay, so there is, I'm looking at the third section called Baseboard Information. And it's got product name. That's what I was looking for. Baseboard not the, the, keep going, not the system information. There you are, top of it. Baseboard Information, Manufacturer, and then underneath it, Product Name. See the product yeah. name? Mm -hmm. X9DRW, that's the Super Micro product name. You could Google that. You could end up on the Supermicro website and look at the specs for that particular system. Okay? Okay. So that's the first piece. DMI decode kind of gives you an idea of what the hardware and the BIOS is telling you. Go ahead and quit out of there. So in my drill then, uh, number of CPUs. How would you find that? Lots of different ways, but you're doing the right. Go ahead, and then you can go down to the end. Yeah. And it's like a uh, variety of information. Now, when SGI software on your UV, there's the topology command that will give you all this information and a different thing. So we got eight CPUs. Okay, I believe it's two sockets, four cores to each. And I really don't quickly. You can go into slash sys to figure out with hyper threads are on or off, but I'm pretty sure they're off. Okay? Okay. So next, uh, let's, for memory, how much memory do we have? And I'm going to have to spend time with you to make sure you understand every field within this uh, mem info. The cache field in particular has a whole bunch of things in it. Understand dirty, write back. Shamam, all that sort of stuff. The slab is the kernel heat. How big is our kernel right now? It looks like we've got a 32 gig memory, right? Right. And the kernel is 520 or 52 meg. Okay. Okay. Do a slab top space dash s space c. Slab top dash s space c s for sort. Okay. Enter. So this will tell you what's in the slab or the kernel heap. So the kernel heap will grow and shrink if I created a huge cache. You see buffer head about five lines down, one, two, six lines, seven lines down, something? Buffer head there? Yes. That's the buffer header chain for the cache. If I had a large cache, that thing would grow to the top. I see D entries for directories. I see I nodes. 
file pointers, FILP. When the kernel need to prevent fragmentation of the kernel heap, if they need a small amount of memory, then you have those size fields. So there's a 32-byte field, there's a 64-byte field, 128, and they get larger and larger. You see those? Yes. The, uh, so that's the generic. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of uh, sizes there. 32, 64, yep. 128, 256. Now, I was expecting we started by size field, and it doesn't look like we started by that. So break out of there again. Slap top dash S, and then a space C. No dash on C? No. Now we're sorting by the cache size. Okay, you see the difference? Yes. Second to last column. So whenever I'm running slab top, I'm just interested in the memory footprint and how big something is. And we've got KMEM cache at the top of it, then ACPI, then inodes, directory cache, D entries, inodes, a uh, looks like a uh, 1024 pool. Again, if the kernel needs, instead of fragmenting and having big and little, big and little, if it needs a 1K byte, it'll just go to the size 124. That makes sense? Yes. Then we, then we don't have to do fragmentation, defragging, garbage collection, uh, all that sort of thing. In fact, it's called compaction nowadays. So when memory gets fragmented, you have to compact things, and that's expensive. Task struct, and there's, that's the process table itself. Now those first one, two, three, four, five, six columns or fields I could care less about. I'm only interested in the size and the structure name. Okay? Okay. And most of them you can kind of make sense. Otherwise, you can Google them or something like that. And it's all coming out of slash proc slash slab info. Okay? Go ahead and quit out of there. And back on the mem info, so we got 32 gig total. Most of it's free. 31 is free. Buffers. Bring up top. And you see the buffers field there? Was that 25 meg? 25 meg, yes. That's raw IO. Okay. This is anything in slash dev. If I did an MD5 sum and slash dev slash SDA, buffers would grow. So anything that is going into slash dev is raw IO. We're bypassing a file system structure. Journaling, logs for file system repairs and stuff are buffered or raw IO. Okay? All right. Any questions right now? None at the moment. So buffers is basically any I.O. that is not going through a super block directory inode structure, but going straight into slash dev. Quit out of there for a second. Do a uh, MD5 sum on slash dev slash SDA. Put it in the ampersand. That's good, ampersand. So we're just doing a checksum on that raw device. Go ahead and hit enter. Go back into top, and it looks like it's growing, right? All right. Yeah, that's that's hitting uh, that direct direct memory there. I'm not going to call it direct memory, and this isn't direct I/O, but we're doing raw I/O. So MD5 sum is reading slash dev slash SDA. And that's showing up as buffers, not as cached. There's no file system in between. Okay? Right. Okay. Get out of there and go ahead and kill it. And go back to your mem info. Yeah, go ahead and kill it, MD5 sum. Just do a kill all MD5 sum. I don't care. Now, we do have to talk about a kill versus a kill dash nine. You know the difference? Um, I think a, a, a kill uh, by default will do a dash 15, which is a little more graceful. Is that correct? 
So a 15 will be masked if an application is smart enough to mask signals. Some applications will have a signal handler say, if I get a 15, go off and checkpoint myself, save myself before I actually kill. That's what we mean by graceful. Okay? Right. A kill 9 will always be seen. Do a kill dash L for me. So if I were to have an application, I, I put it in the background, but it's suspended. OK, and you can do that with the signal there. A stop, a 19, is the same thing. Okay. And if I could do a kill, that stop is holding that signal, a pending signal, and the program will not see it. So for example, I fire something off in the background, go home, then, then I want to uh, deal with it, and it's in a stop, I can't kill. And if I do a kill nine, that could be ungraceful and not allow the application to save itself, checkpoint itself. So you could actually send the signal and then do a signal 18. And an 18 will continue it. OK, so if I did a control Z, go ahead, let's, let's do that MD5 sum again. Yeah, Z puts a, puts a cease on it or a pause, correct? Correct, then that's what we're talking about. Go ahead and run that MD5 sum again. Oh, I'm sorry, let's kill it. I, I, I'm sorry, I wanted it without the ampersand sign this time and then control Z it. I kill all MD5 sum. That's fine too, either way, I don't care. We all have our habits. Okay, now do the MD5 sum without the ampersand sign. Right, so it'll stay. Uh... And then we're going to control Z it now. Okay, bring up top. And notice we have a stopped process. See that on the second line from the top? Right, yes. So we've got that pause signal that we were just talking about. Go ahead and quit out of there. Uh, PS-EL, pipe, grep, quote, space, uppercase T, space, close the quote. And there's your stop process. OK? All right. See the T in there? Now try a kill all MD5 sum. Do your PS again, up arrow. Still there. Because it stopped, it does not see the signal yet. OK? All right. Stop me if you get any questions. So the correct way to me, instead of doing the 9, would be to restart this process. So do your kill dash L. And sig continue is an 18. So do a dash 18. Kill all. Let's do a kill all. Unless you got the PID. Dash 18, MD5 sum. Go ahead. Now it saw the signal. OK. OK. So I just want to clarify the difference between a 15 and a 9, OK? Because okay. uh, high naps will actually catch signals. And if the 15 comes in, it may be jumping off to a routine that's going to checkpoint its memory. And you don't want to do a 9 in that case. We OK with that? Yes. Anyways, it got off topic here a little bit. Go back to the top. I was just reacting to your kill 9. So the stop process is gone. Yeah, I appreciate that. No, I, and again, as it, that's what I've been doing for 30 years is training and reacting. There's also a zombie field there. What's a zombie? A zombie is a process that is dead, but it still has a process table entry to it. So it's not using any memory space. 
but it could, for example, be a process that has a network socket connection that hasn't timed out yet. So I've been into sites where they had like a, a hundred or two hundred threads that were connected on a socket, waiting for that socket to complete, and the zombie will show up until socket timeouts occur and stuff. Also, if I were to storm the system, I've got lab exercises where I can just pound the system with millions of processes. And when they're terminating, it takes time for them to clean up, and then you see zombies. And right now, there is a SGI bug that I see where PCP has got a zombie being left. No, I'm sorry. It was Memlog D that had a uh, RPM zombie sticking behind it. So zombies can be good or bad. The only way to get rid of them is a reboot, assuming that they aren't cleaning up on themselves. For example, I could kill the parent and then the child might become a zombie because when the child dies, there's nobody to bury it. You okay? Yes. Now let's, uh, so we're talking about memory a little bit, but we got off topic just talking about stopped and zombied. That PS that we did, you could do a Z, capital Z, instead of a capital T, and then find your zombies to find out what they are. Okay? okay. So we got mem total, mem used, mem free, and then we we're talking about buffers. So we got about six, seven gig of uh, buffer space right now. Quit out of there and do your slab top again. Slab top dash S space C. And notice buffer head is now at the top. So that's the kernel structure that keeps track of those buffers. OK? On these large 16, 64 terabyte UVs, you could have a huge buffer header chain describing all the cache that's in memory. OK? okay. So let's quit out of there. Different ways of doing it, but let's do a sysctl w. VM dot VM dot drop underscore caches. V Victor virtual memory. You got a D. Virtual memory dot drop underscore caches equal. Now, a 1 says cache, a 2 says this kernel, a 3 says both. Let's just do a 1. Go ahead. And now let's look at top again. And notice our buffers are now trimmed. OK? If it was a 64 terabyte machine, it could take in half an hour to do that trim. Trimming the kernel is a lot slower and takes a lot more time than trimming the slab, or trimming the cache. Notice the cache field also dropped down. We didn't have SAR running in the background. I think you said you'd used SAR before. Uh, yes, to some degree, yes. So if we had SAR, we would have been able to see both the buffers and the cache get trimmed. Quit out of there. Let's look at mem info again. Proc mem info. How big's our kernel? So which field was the kernel size? The uh, active slab. Oh yeah. Okay. We'll talk about active inactive some other day. There's swappiness that controls how quickly you rotate from active to inactive and that sort of thing. And I hate to log into a 64 terabyte machine and see 63 terabyte of inactive cache. Anon is the process space itself. And then file is the cache. OK? So if I, there's a command called memhog. Do memhog uh, 10 gig and then put it in the background. Space 10 G. Let it run. No, no, don't do that yet. Just uh, back up, enter. Go ahead, just hit enter. And let's let it run for a second. Control Z it. Control Z it now. 
Okay, so let's do a PS to make sure it's still there. Uh, I don't. Control, I, think, I think it finished before we control Z. That's what I was wondering because 10 gig goes by real quick. Why don't you just try it again? Do a control Z quickly. Yeah, I was just trying to give it a little bit of yeah. After three lines or something. Now there, good. Now check that it's still there. Yep. So I see it yep. there. Uh, PS is very terrible at giving memory sizes, but uh, let's go into top. Let's do an I. Now an I just got rid of all that noise, but that doesn't help us either. This process is sleeping. We're sorting by percent CPU hog, and this thing is sleeping, so it won't, or it paused, so we won't be able to see it. So do an I again. Now do a capital O. And let's sort by RSS size, Q. Type in, there you go. Virtual is completely meaningless in Linux. We can oversubscribe memory if, if uh, anyway. Virtual is completely useless and meaningless because we can oversubscribe memory. Swap, by the way, is also meaningless. It's basically virtual minus RSS. It, it, you could have zero swap configured and still have a huge swap size. It's just what's the difference between the virtual and the physical. Questions okay. yet? Go ahead and hit enter. Okay. And there's memhog now. Okay. So it reserved 10 gig, but it only got to 4 gig in its allocation. Okay. Notice the state is a T. Question? No question. By the way, while I'm in top, do an F. Oops, oh. go back into top. Do an F. And I always like to see W chan. Hit a Y. Go back into F. And hit Y. WChan is the kernel subroutine a process is sleeping on. So you can spot whether it's sleeping in I.O., sleeping in QTEX weights, things like that. Now we got all those kernel threads, don't really care about them, but I always like to have WChan visible. Priority is pretty meaningless because of the uh, completely fair scheduler. They're all 20 or else real time. So it's a completely useless field. Virtual is really useless as well. Do a capital W. And quit. Do a cat dot top RC, cat space dot top RC. And when you did the W, you created that file with your various configuration choices that you had. Now do your top again. And notice W Chan is there still. All personal preference. Okay. Any questions right now? I don't know if I'm uh, repeating stuff you know old school or whether this is constructive or not. Notice we do still have Memhawk stopped. By the way, the load level. The load level is all the R's and all the D's for the state field. There's an R. That's top. But anything that's sleeping on an I.O. will also show in the load level. So you could have an NFS server, you log in, there's no CPU utilization, but it's got a load level of 100 because there's 100 threads waiting on I.O. So the D, you, the state field, right, next to RES, the S field? Yep. Okay, so if there's a D there, WCHAN will tell you what it's waiting on. And D means it's non-interruptible in some sort of I.O. state. Okay? Okay. So let's quit. Uh, where were we, though? Uh, used. How much memory is used now? Uh, we were at 4 gig. Do a more on ProcMem info again.
and Anon pages, including Active Anon. Notice it's showing four gig for Active Anon right now, and then Anon a little bit further down. Can you find Anon pages right after right back? Um, About in the middle. Here we go, yes. Go ahead and highlight it. Yep. So that's our process of four gig. Okay. Well, let's do something else here. CD into slash dev slash SHM. Now, before we do, cached field is at uh, 19 meg right now. Okay. See the third line down? We're at 19 meg. Yep. So now let's dd slash def slash zero uh, less than, I think some people use if, less than. I like to use less than. No, go back. We need an if equals or a less than sign. Personal preference. I use less than. That's fine. If equal slash def slash zero greater than sign. It is three, two characters less. <laughs> file. Go ahead, just type file, hit enter. I'm lazy. I'm not going to put block counts or anything like that. So I'm just letting it go for a minute till I feel like something's happened. It's just laziness, okay? Okay. Go ahead, control C it out. LS-HL. So we got about an 8 gig file there. Go back to your ProcMem info now. And notice the cache field has now grown, and the Shemem field halfway down has also grown. Shemem is part of the cache field. Okay? okay. We're gonna, I'm going to pound on you in this cache field so that you understand everything that's in that cached field. If I do that drop caches like we did before for the buffers, it's not going to get rid of this. And by default, dev shemem can take half your physical memory. OK? okay. You can do the cat on uh, itcfs tab. And I'm just looking for shemem does not have, it's not even in there, right? But we could add a Shemem entry into there and then it put a size field on it to limit the amount of memory that Shemem can take. We okay? Yes. Now there is one other piece of Shemem that can suck up memory. IPCS dash AM. Do an IPCS. Inter process communication status. Go ahead. And so interprocess communication is shared memory, semaphores, and messages. The, the shared memory segments can suck up a lot of memory and highlight the unattach field. You see it there? Shared memory segments over on the right, second to the last column next to status. Oh, there we go. I was looking for an I. <laughs> no, that's OK. So I could, in your case, when you did the kill dash 9, it could have left unattached shared memory segments there that suck up all your memory. And then the thing runs again and you kill it with an Ash 9 and now it's left all these unattached shared memory segments and pretty soon you got a memory leak and nothing's able to run. Mm, okay. So just be aware of uh, how quick and easily you can suck up memory and have a memory leak and lose it. So we're just talking about memory question. No, I'm just glad that this is uh, performance-minded um, because that, that's one place that I, I haven't had to spend a lot of time is, is the performance arena. Sure. All I'm doing is an inventory of the system right? and accounting for resources. That's really what I'm doing here, right? Right. So I just wanted to poke into MemInfo a little bit. Go back to MemInfo again. I repeat this on you over and over again, but go halfway down. Dirty, right back. See the dirty, right back? Uh-huh. Highlight dirty for me. 
So dirty is data that I have written in my application. The DD command, for example, going off to a disk file. At some point, based upon how much memory is dirty or how long it's been dirty, there will be a flush daemon that will pop up and start flushing it. So this is a delayed write. If I'm doing read, write, read, write, why have it write from memory to disk if I'm doing a read, write, read, write and keep changing it? I want to satisfy that out of cache, right? Correct? You get my right. point? Yes. So at some point, based upon sysctl parameters, the dirty will then become a write back. So write back is data that has been marked to flush. Do a ps-e and grep for flush. So you see a major minor number at the end of it that will tell you the file system that that flush daemon is responsible for. And if you bring up top and you're actually busy flushing, you'll be able to see the flush daemon come in. You'll be able to see process going to sleep on a write, that sort of thinking. So I don't want to get into the CCL parameters that control that flush behavior. But when I write, dirty goes to write back when the flush daemon, or if I do a sync, the sync command would also force a write back. Okay? okay. And then once write back is done, then it is something I call clean. Now, clean is something that Performance Copilot derives for me. And clean basically means if I take a service interruption, it's, it's been flushed out of memory and we still depend upon the rate or whatever to ensure that it got to the platter. Uh, about 10 lines down from there is NFS unstable. You see NFS unstable? So that is data I'm writing to an NFS server. So if I write to NFS, it goes from dirty to write back and then write back to NFS unstable, and then from there it becomes clean and clean data is part of the cached field. Most of that ever crud we don't care about. Bounce I don't care about. Write back temp, commits, the VM malics don't care. Uh, US Post Office does use huge pages. And they did have a case here a couple months ago that they had downsized the amount of memory and still had huge pages that basically were bigger than physical memory and they couldn't get their system booted. So I'm not going to talk about huge pages, but they are relevant at the post office with uh, Oracle. A huge page, their default page size is 4K bytes. When we try to reference into a virtual address in the program, we have to look at the translation look aside buffer to get a physical address of it. The TOB is on the processor on the chip itself. If it doesn't find the virtual to physical mapping there, then it has to take a TOB miss to the kernel. The kernel goes to a page table, gets the physical address, and puts that back into the uh, uh, TOB buffer. The advantage of huge pages is less TOB misses, assuming you're doing sequential strides through memory. If I'm doing random memory references, there's no guarantee that the next uh, address I reference is going to be within the same page. And the default there, if I wanted to just pick the default, would go from a 2 or 4K byte to a 2 megabyte page size. And you can track TLB misses and where they're occurring in the program and all that sort of stuff. I'm kind of done with memory. Any, any questions right now? Uh, none at the moment. By the way, let's just type in SAR 1 space 5. One space five, five samples, one second apart. So we're pretty idle here. Uh, trying to think of something we can do to spin it up, but type in perp space top. Now perp is not loaded by default, but I've loaded it here already. So that actually is telling me where my CPUs are. It's doing an address mapping. We don't have anything running, so it's idle and pointless. But particularly if we have high system time, it's extremely useful. Quit out of there. Control there. Uh, do a perf space 
No, let's get out. No, we can stay in this directory. That's fine. Per record space record dash. No, I'm sorry. It's no dash space dash g dash g. Was there a dash dash g? Go ahead and hit enter. Oh, you didn't get it right. Something was wrong. Try typing again. Perf record dash g. Is there? I can't see a dash. Might be there, but maybe mm -hmm. there was a sure. hidden character or something. I'll type it again just to make sure. Yeah. Hmm. Doesn't like that. Let me try. G before record. No. The G is actually going to give you symbol table and a butterfly report. Maybe they've changed the syntax a little bit too. No, I don't think you want that, but is G still there? Uh, yeah, I see that's G in the... Yeah. Command there. And by default, it was writing into a file called perf.data. So what's it complaining about at the top? It's just giving us syntax use. Try just a perf record. It doesn't like perf record. Yeah, it doesn't like that I at all. Perf dash all. No, try perf record dash. We're running the latest patch sets, and they might have changed something. Perf record dash o and then file. Try that. Let's get out of this dev shemem. Let's go into root and see if that's a problem. <coughs> I could try running strace to isolate too, but... It doesn't like something going on here. Hang on. Uh, I'm just going to come back to this later. Something seems to have changed or broken on this one. Okay, no worries. Yeah, uh, let me just check another system here. I mean, this is the latest patch set, so. I don't know what I'm doing wrong now. Oh, sorry. Let's. We were not specifying. It's my mistake. It's been a while. I don't. Know. We're not specifying what we want to record. Add a dash a. Per record dash g dash a. Dash a for all. Go ahead. That's what I forgot. A dash P for a PID, a dash T for a thread, or dash A for everything. Go ahead and break out of there now. So now you can do a perf report. So now we actually see the kernel subroutines and do a shift capital I, I believe. Try shift I. Hang on. So when you have high system time, this is how you can figure out what it is. Shift capital E, sorry. Do D shift cap. Question? D is in dog? E, everything. Expand, actually. E for expand. Okay. So now you can actually see the calling sequence 
And for example, with GPUDB, when you get into this, you can see Futex wake ups and 90% system time all in a kernel spin lock. So you have different reasons. The perk top itself just tells you the occurrence of that routine, but not how you got there. So you can have different reasons that you end up in a spin lock. So the dash G is actually tracing the whole calling sequence. Some people call it a butterfly report. Go ahead and quit out of there. There is a dash, dash STDIO and stuff like that, so you can put it into an ASCII report. So anyways, real quickly, we've looked at CPUs real quickly, and I was using perf and top to profile them. And then we looked at memory real quickly and was just pulling apart meminfo a little bit. Okay? All right. So I'm going to move on. When I look at a system, it's CPU first, memory second. What do you think's third? Disk I.O. Yeah, I.O. and disks. So CPU, memory, disk. So let's start off with an LS SCSI. So we got a DVD. We've got two uh, Western Digital and two Seagates. Do a DF. And we're booted on SDA, right? Yes. Do a parted slash dev SDB. Enter. P. So there we have another root. Notice the file system type is BTRFS. Now basically parted is looking at the super block on that partition to figure out what file system type it is. OK? Unfortunately, we cannot mount that on SLES 11. Quit out of there. Try a mount slash dev slash SDB1 on MNT. Like dev SDB1 on slash MNT. Go ahead. And tail bar log messages or D message, either one. Bar log messages at least has timestamps on it. Couldn't now mount because of unsupported optional features. Okay? All right. Now let's check SDC. Parted on slash dev SDC. P. So there is a partition there. Not very big, right? Yeah, it's just got a grub loader on there, looks like. Yep. So let's quit out of there. By the way, I'm not so familiar with that newer partition table of a GPT sync MBR. I'm used to GPT and MS DOS. Let's try SDD. Parted on SDD. Nothing. And nothing's there. And notice it's a GPT. Right. So, uh, do a make, no, go back into it. Do a make table, MS DOS. That's okay. Uh, we are on D, good. And again, sandbox is scratch, so I'm not caring about anything here. Type in P. Now, we don't have any partitions, but we still have a partition table. Right? Right. Now, do you understand the difference between GPT and MS-DOS? GPT has a backup partition table at the end of the volume. OK? OK. So if I want to redeploy this drive, I'm going to change the table to an MS-DOS. Now I can quit. Go ahead and quit. Okay. And let's clobber the partition table at the beginning of the drive. So DD slash uh, less than slash dev slash zero, however you want to do it. That's fine. Slash dev slash zero. And then I'll put file. It's going to be slash dev slash SDD. Again, I'm being lazy. 
I'm not putting in a count or anything like that. Okay. That's SDD? Enough, right? SDD? Is that D? DD, yes. Delta okay. Delta. Go ahead. Again, I'm being lazy and say, eh, good enough. Go ahead, break out. You can be more picky if you want. But So we wrote, uh, what, 3 gig onto the drive already? Uh, looks like 368 meg. Meg, yeah. The fonts are still a little bit small for me. But let's go back into parted now. and type in P. Notice there's no partition table now. Unrecognized disk label. Okay? All right. So I've stepped on that drive just so that we can reuse it if we want to install something on it. Okay? Now let's get the uh, ID. Quit out of there. ls-l slash dev slash disk. Space. No, I just go for all of them. Personal preference again. Just dev disk, pipe, grep, SDD. Everyone has different ways of doing it. SDD didn't show up. Oh, R, doing R, sorry. Yeah, that one will work too. So, what is the last numbers there? Uh, v, L, R, J, I can't read it. Write that down if you got a hand piece of paper. Victor Lima. Easy. J. You can be, you can be picky and copy the whole doggone thing, but I'm, I usually just grab the last four characters of the device ID. Is that better? Yep. Not a whole lot, but yeah. V-L-E-J, is that what I see, V-L-E-J? Yes, that's correct. So before I start to install on a disk, I want to make sure that I get the right one. As you know, rebooting doesn't always give you the same SD device name order, right? Right. And, and in fact, when you go into rescue mode or something, the order of the drivers can change things. Same thing with network interfaces. Uh, uh, PCI slot NICs will usually be discovered before the uh, onboard NICs. Okay, so we looked at CPU, we looked at memory, we looked at disk. We look, I actually go through six things. CPU, memory, disk, file system buffer cache, interprocess communication, and networks. And we kind of went through file system buffer cache quickly and IPC. So now let's look at the networks real quick. Okay. So I config. Now, uh, you weren't here when we were uh, rehooking up Sandbox, but we talked about that BMC. On these SMNs, the BMC is actually a separate RJ45 plugin. But on a lot of other systems, it might be shared with ETH0. Ah, okay. So they might have different Macs. But we're going to want ETH0. Uh, grab that Mac, that 40. Open up another window and go into FCL-Server. I want to make sure that itcdacp.com has that MAC added to it. I think it does, but just check. Uh, do a VI or more. I don't care. Yeah, I'm going to change this so you can see it. No, that's fine. Yep, that's fine. That's much better to read. So let's just check that uh, that MAC is in the itcdacp.com. I'm getting dizzy. There we are. So, v, yeah, dhcp.com. Well, it's going to be a long one. You might, I mean, it won't help you either. I want to make sure it's the right Mac. 
So you're better off doing a VI or more DHCPD. Good. Search for sandbox. Search, uh, let's just uh, page through it, I guess. There it is, okay. And do we have the right Mac port is the question. 2590, it looks like it's right. Okay. Yep. So quit out of there. Now the other thing, go back to sandbox. Leave that window, but just bring the other sandbox window to the front. Type in IPMI tool shell. Type in help. So those are your basic commands. The man page isn't very good on this, but the uh, the interface itself is pretty good. So do a LAN and hit enter. LAN. Okay, so now it says I can do a LAN print, or I can this is how I can set IPs and net masks and stuff like that. Okay, but let's do a LAN space print space one. Go ahead. And it doesn't like it. Quit out of here. Quit out of there. We're doing in-band. Go ahead, quit. Exit, whatever. Uh, check config. If you like dash dash list, grep for IPMI. That's all. It's off. It's off. We only need the first one, check config IPMI on. And both of us got to figure out SLES 12 and system D and stuff like that, the system CTL stuff. Now service IPMI start. That's one reason for sandbox is that we can get some SLES 12 time. Now do an LS mod and grep for IPMI. Do an LS mod first, grep for IPMI. So now you can see there's uh, kernel modules loaded. Yep. Questions? So now let's go back into IPMI tool. Now if I'm in Audubon, which we're going to use in a little bit, there will be passwords and stuff. But go ahead. Everyone does a little bit different. Some people do IPMI tool and then LAN print one, but I like to drip to the IPMI shell. Go ahead. So now we can see what the BMC is set for. Notice it's got an IP address of 10.12, net mask. Uh, we don't have a gateway. There's no point in configuring a gateway. I don't want this thing to go outside the subnet, right? Right. So there is a LAN set to be able to change the IP. Do a LAN space set and hit enter. And then you can see the syntax is set IP, net mask, stuff like that, default gateway. Okay. So everyone's a little different. You know, we all have our traits, but I kind of like using the help that the shell provides me directly. It's not so much fun if you quit out of there. And uh, just do a man and IPMI tool. Now you figure out which is easier to use. <laughs> it's personal preference. Go ahead, page down. I forget how long it is, but all of them, we don't really care about the command line options. And then there's the individual commands. Okay, so that's okay. But I just it's personal preference. I like to just do IPMI tool shell and then use the help that's available to me from the shell itself. So you got power on, power off, and stuff like that. Now we're in band, so we're running on the same host. So not all commands are valid in band. Okay, you can't right. get a console in band. I don't think you can even do power in band. But you definitely, I wanted you to know how to set the IP address for IPMI for the BMC. Okay. Okay. So let's come out of there. So we know which disk drive we're going to use. We know which MAC address we're going to be looking for. Let's get out of let's get out of sandbox. 
I think you probably went to FCL that server, so exit out of there. And by the way, sometimes when you try to log out, instead of saying there are stop jobs, it seems to hang on the log out, but there are processes in the background. It just doesn't always tell you that there are stop jobs. So I might have an X11 GUI or something running, and I try to log out, and it, it just sits there. Taking for it won't actually get logged out. Ah. So now we're ready to move forward. We're now going to go out of band to this device. So IPMI tool dash capital I capital I. Space lowercase LAN plus L A N P U P L U S space. Now this is confusing, but Supermicro and Intel have different setups for their BMCs. So you kind of got to know SGI ships both kinds of BMCs. And if it's an Intel BMC, then there's a dash, we're not going to use it here, but there's a dash O option to say Intel Plus. Okay. They also have different passwords. One is uppercase and one is lowercase. So there's a possibility for you to end up connecting to an Intel BMC instead of a super micro BMC. So I'm not going to worry about Intel, but with Intel, you're going to have lowercase admin and you're going to have a dash O Intel Plus that are different. In this case, we're going to do a dash capital U space uppercase admin, uppercase all, all words. And by the way, I'm not using it, but there is a web interface to this as well. Space dash capital P space uppercase admin. space dash capital H. Now, I already have it in the NC host, so sandbox dash BMC. And then shell, sandbox dash, dash, there we go, dash BMC space shell. Now, if we were to bring up BMC viewer, we could get a web interface to this as well. That requires Java working and all kinds of stuff. Again, sometimes I use it Windows. We're going to need to use it. But here I'm just going ASCII. It's all personal preference again. I'm trying to teach low level first. So go ahead and hit enter. Type in power. Tells you what to try. What do you want to try? Status? Now give me a second here. Okay. So you can do power on, off, reset, cycle, that sort of thing. If you're off and do a cycle, it'll go on and back off again. There are other things available with IPMyTools. So you were talking about uh, SNMP and Monit and stuff like that. On the UV, the CMC is talking to the BMCs with IPMyTool and then feeding it to Monit. So type in sensor. And there's your environmental data for that particular BMC. OK? okay. Temperatures and all that sort of stuff. And in the future, we're hoping that the, the uh, NVIDIA cards will have a monitoring interface through the SGI BMC so that we don't have to be running demons on the load and everything would be going through this black net that they're going to call it at Postal, which is basically a maintenance management network. 
So on the UV, there's a daemon that's running on the CMC that's running the sensor command and then sending it off to Monit. Okay? Okay. Now try SOL activate. Serial over LAN activate. Yep. Hit enter. Interesting. Hang on a second. I grabbed the console. I was hoping that you would not be able to get that because I was supposed to have the console. But it looks like my session logged out. Uh, let me try it again. You mean escape and, you mean escape and try it again? No. Uh, and it's not escape. So how do you get out? Tilde dot, or if you're SSH, you might have to do more than one tilde. So see if you can get in again. I don't know what's going on. Tilde dot, sometimes it takes a couple of tries. It's not always clean on picking up the characters. But I've got the console right now, and it should say you it's already it should say to you that it's already activated. Yeah, it uh it did kick me out. I'm not sure if it was graceful with my key. Yeah, I know again it's not very graceful. So up arrow and let's try getting in again. But yeah, the tilde dot or if you've SSH'd a couple of times, tilde's for each SSH. Sometimes I'll do tilde dot and then fall out three machines or whatever. Soul activate. Enter. Huh. Okay, it's not complaining. And in fact, I was already logged in on my terminal. I logged in to try to steal, to hold the console. But if you ever get saying it's already activated, there's a deactivate. That's what I was trying to stress. Ah, okay. And now, this is a fun point. I'm sorry? And because you're logged in, I'm logged in. Correct. However, the console was left. Right. So what was an interesting one, log out again. Oh, by the way, that broke my connection. It just stole it is what it's doing right now. Ah, okay. And tilde dot isn't working very good for me either right now. What has happened with even the best at SGI, they'll be on that serial console and then SSH to another machine and then SSH to another machine. And then the next time they connect to the console, they go, wait a second, that's not the machine I'm connecting to. Okay. So anyways, let's log in again. So the whole purpose of these BMCs is for us to get into the system as a maintenance interface if networks aren't working, for example. Of course, we still need an RJ45 network to get to the BMC, but if we haven't configured the network and stuff, then this is a way of doing that. But also to be able to do installs and stuff like that. So let's do a reboot. The other thing is when the system is booting and shutting down, this is the only way I can see if it's cleanly shutting down or cleanly booting. And if I have a file system problem, it might drop into single user mode and I have to get to the serial console. Go ahead. Usually when I have that sort of problem, I log in and then edit FS tab and remove all the extraneous entries and then reboot again. I also want to be able to get you into rescue and single user mode at some point, not today. So to review, to begin with today, I kind of did a quick inventory of the system and poked around on what the meminfo means and what perp means. Covered inter-process communication, buffers, cache, dirty, write back, NFS unstable. I myself, when I bounce a machine, prefer to have the serial console. Okay, hit a uh, delete key, I think. Hit a delete key. And then wait. I hit so the delete. delete. The delete should drop into the BIOS. 
Now there are a couple of other control strokes to drop into the uh, LSI. There we are. There are a couple of other control strokes to drop into the LSI prom and drop into the uh, Intel Pixie boot menus and stuff like that. So I don't know if you're. We need to put some of the stuff into the uh, operational procedures, but the delete key is how you get into it. Now uh, I had to do three. I had to do a couple of things here. First of all, right arrow one to advanced, and then go down to uh, uh, console redirection. And again, on these systems, I don't care about, but on the UVs like the 300, I want to get screenshots so I don't have to drop into BIOS to be able to figure out what screenshot I want to look at. Now, I don't know why SGI does it, but they enable COM2, not necessarily COM1. So that causes the console output to come to the BMC. And go down one. I didn't have to change any of these settings, but go ahead, hit enter. And notice we have a VT UTF-8. I'm curious, I don't want to mess with Marvin or anything, but I'm curious as to how Marvin had its console set up. Remember all the problems we had on the console? Yeah, the, the F10 F10 problem. Yeah. So uh, when we get a chance, I might try to change that. Again, when I was coming in through the BMC, I set the terminal type to X term, and then Yast showed me where I was in the cursor, had colors, and remember we were trying to down arrow and couldn't tell where we were, right? Right. It was a set to a VT120. When I set the terminal to X term, then Yast was usable again, but that didn't resolve the installer. But again, Marvins are in production, and I don't want to step on them. Escape right. to back out of there. Escape again. So I only enabled COM, the second COM, COM2. Uh, we're not quite done yet. Uh, we're not, quit without saving. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I think you hit the escape too many times, so we'll see oh. where we come up again. So we're booting now. Now this initialized GFX code you just got to wait for a few minutes, but if you were actually go to the VGA console, you would be able to see the uh, boot menu come up. Let's do a tilde, tilde dot. Can you break out of there? Can you get back to the IPMI shell prompt? Well, I hit it. I don't know. Uh, I know. A couple I of times. I know. Doing anything. It's really fussy. Just keep trying. Tilde dot or control C. Oh, we got a new menu here. Okay, so it looks like it is in the. Uh, it looks like it booted from uh, DVD. So we need to still quit out of here. I didn't want to get this far quite yet. So see if you can still get back to IPMI tool. Even if even if you have to control Z and kill IPMI tool, I don't care. Tilde dot. Try control Z and just kill it then. Control Z it. Will it control Z? No, not doing anything for me. Uh, you got FCL server in the right window. Find it and kill it that way. It's it's pretty picky sometimes, and the tilde dot doesn't always seem to get to it. Just kill that. Yeah, kill all or kill one eight zero eight four. Yeah, that's good. That's the way. Everyone has their own habits. So now I'll go back to your left window. Bring up IP my tool again, and I want to do a power reset this time. Go ahead. And then pick it, so up arrow or whatever. 
That one. There. Enter. Power reset. I wanted to change the. I wanted to look at the boot order, but basically, I think you hit escape one too many times, and then it picked the auto boot, which is off a of DVD. No, no, no. No. Hang on a second. Uh, yeah, that is what I want. Sorry. Let's get the console again. And by the way, I could have another IPMI tool in the other window. Okay, escape. I'm sorry, delete. Get a delete in there. See if we can catch the delete. But sometimes in the other window, I might have an IPMI tool. Instead of a uh, shell, I might do a power reset. There, we are entering setup. So if I'm too late, as long as I power reset before we've mounted file systems, we're okay. But once the kernel's mounted root, I don't want to just do a power reset. So I want to go over to boot. So see that our first boot option is actually the DVD, ah. right? And that's what we were hitting was the DVD installer, which is fine, but that's not what I want for a default. So now hit, you tab down, I believe, to that one, and hit a, no, go up, hit a minus sign. The minus sign should drop it down there. Okay? All right. All of that. But let's go to the IDAGE slot. I want a Pixie install. I want to test that. The down arrow to. And then plus sign, and it'll shift up one. Now up arrow. Oops, plus sign. What happened? There, on that one. Plus to move it up. There we are. Up arrow now. It's funky, but up arrow now plus again. Oh, you got to follow it. Uh-huh. You got it. Okay. Okay, so now we've got it at the top of the list. So now let's uh, go to the right and save and exit. Now, I'm kind of messing with you here, but we could also see that boot override. We could have used yeah. that and say, keep it booting from SDA, but right now I just want to boot from network. Ah. So let's, do, let's say no, quit without saving no. And now, yeah, let's fix that. Move that down. Move that down below the DVD. And then go over to save and exit, but don't actually. And now down arrow to the boot override. And now let's try that one. Okay. So sometimes students will put that at the top, and then they forget, and then the second time it boots, it does it again, particularly if it's auto yapped. All right, so just hit enter on that selection? Yep, that should be it. So again, you'll get plenty of time to practice and stuff. OK, now where is this going? Where is this boot going? Well, that's the that server. If you do a take, go to the right window and tail dash F and bar lock messages. And there it is. Looks like about the right timestamp. Uh, 3D colon 40 looks like it's there. Offer, request, and then acknowledged. It gave, I don't know why it gave it an IP of 150, though. I didn't really check what we had. Let me check. I haven't tried this in a while, so we're going to see what happens here. Okay. Yeah, Sandbox, uh, the uh, DHCP.com file gave it a 150. 
which isn't right, but that'll work. So I'm not seeing anything happening yet. I would expect something to happen by now. I mean, we gave it an IP and everything. You can see it's in the uh, bar lock messages. But there's something else going wrong here. I think I'm going to... Uh, change DHCP post to the, uh, it should be 11 actually. So I just changed it, even though you were in it at the time. Yeah, you can see it's at 11 now. I don't see anything else wrong with what's up there. And then I re what I'm hoping to see is an eLilo boot prompt. So go into the right window again. Mm -hmm. Yep, IPMyTool-ILAN-plus-uppercase-U admin, uppercase P admin. Uh, it's not in my history here. Yeah, not on that one. I like to make people retype it. Dash capital I. I. Inside I, not a, is that a T? No, that's I. Okay, it just got truncated on the bottom. Land plus, lowercase. Dash capital U, uppercase admin, dash capital P, uppercase admin, dash capital H, sandbox dash BMC, space, power, no, I want to do it different here, power reset. Just a little bit easier for you. Go ahead. So that way you can up arrow and not have to go through the shell and, and just bang it as needed. Gotcha. I wonder what's going on. I can see the Intel boot agent going on. I haven't done this, so there now we're rebooting. So that's the initial BIOS coming up. Hit your delete, delete key again. again. Hit delete again. There is that control S as well. We can try that here in a second. And if you were to do a firmware mirroring and stuff, you drop into the LSI uh, interface. So let's just go check on the boot order. Ah, it didn't save. Yeah, that's okay. Let's just, uh, yeah, let's fix it so that we always boot from disk. That way if this, if somebody doesn't in at six, it doesn't go to the uh, DVD that's in the system right now. Okay. So do we want to try the uh, override again or no? Just save changes first. Let's save changes first. What? Okay, so we're seeing a pixie um, boot going on. Yeah, I think I know what I did. Never mind. And tail the shaft to see if it's picking it up. All right, do I need... Go ahead, uh, however you want to do it. You want to let it go? It's picking the right IP address this time. Yeah. R repetition is good as far as I'm concerned. Okay. But I don't know why we're actually, we're not actually getting the uh, the bootloader itself to work correctly. Again, I haven't done this. We installed with uh, DVD last time. That's fine. 
So we can see that it gets an IP and everything, and you can see there it gets the IP, but then it's not actually getting the uh, uh, break out of on the right, break out of there, and look at itcdhcp.com it's again. So if you look at Sandbox, gives the IP, we get that, but then it's calling the boot x64.efi. And that's what should actually, it doesn't look like it's understanding or getting that boot x64. Anyway, let's do a power reset. I'm not going to pursue this any further right now. I was just trying to see if we could pixie boot. And I don't want to we'll spend back, time. We'll go, back in and, we'll go back in and vet the, uh, the boot order and, uh, and save that. So let's not go into BIOS right now. Let's see if it's going to uh, get to the eLilo boot from disk. If I'm you haven't hit the boot. I'm not positive I saved it last time. Well, we'll find out. Okay. Again, uh, as a trainer, I like you to have to go through repetition. And there is a... Uh, Intel Pixie bootloader that we might try booting from some other day. I'm not in a hurry on that right now. Again, I was just trying to give you some experience with this uh, sandbox because this will be your toy. Yeah, absolutely. And we should be able to change that boot menu now to boot off of SLES 12. And all of us need to learn butter and how to deal with snapshots and stuff and system CTL and I don't have any experience yet, so. How long do you believe uh, it will take USPS to adopt uh, SLES 12 well, and Butter? I don't know, at, at least a year. Okay. Though I expect them to go to SLES 11 SP4 next. But it's a good question in the hot politics, but let them do it on their HP boxes first. I was expecting to see something by now. Garbage. Yeah, we got something. Hit a tab key. There, we're getting a kernel boot now. Okay. So uh, you did save it properly, so it is booting off the... Uh, uh, SDA. Okay. But if you want, I'm, I'm planning on wrapping up here in 10 minutes or so, and you can putz around with the box for a little bit and see if you can boot off of SDB and get SLES 12 booted. Whatever you yeah, want right. to do, again, uh, just managing your time. I'm just getting it started on this BMC interface so that you can see what's going on. That's perfect. Uh, how soon will you have this recording uh, posted somewhere? Uh, in an hour or something. Okay. So let's log in. Cat. C-A-T space slash itsy. Slash asterisk. Splat. Release. Splat. Go ahead. So I can see this plus 11 SP3. CD into itsy zip repos.d. No, ZYPP, sorry. Oh. As in zipper. Okay. Yeah. Repo tab. Go ahead. So I had registered the system to get the latest updates. But once I get SMT and our uh, mirror credentials working, I want to get back to snapshots off of FCL-server. 
And notice I added the GPDB repo in there too. Let's do a more on the first one, the SUSE Linux. I see I don't have the SDK added or anything like that. Go ahead. So that's what it looks like. Do one on the GPDB. And notice I've got test. Oh, it's not actually putting the password in there, so when we actually do a prompt, it might be asking for the password on that particular download. And the password, right now I have test, test as the uh, password. I'm going to remove that once we get into uh, using it more. Do a zipper space LR. No, no dash. Yeah, I know. One dash, two dashes, no dashes. No dash, no dash. And then that's listing all the repositories. And notice a lot of them are not enabled right now. Only the uh, updates in the pool at the end. OK. OK. Do a zipper space PA. Oh, no, break out of there. Sorry. Control C. Abort. Control C, get out of there. Control C, out of there. You got, you're going to have a long list. <laughs> so this time up arrow, pipe it into uh, more. I just didn't want to list every package. Actually, let's instead of more, let's grep for kernel. So this will show you what packages that match that kernel string and what repository it's coming from. Okay, and you can see all the different kernel flavors that are out there on the uh, Novell update server and stuff like that. Wow. Okay. Let's do YAST. Uh, I guess it's okay. Uh, go over to the right, tab to the right, down to software management. Up one, there we are. Enter. Shift tab to the search. There we are. Uh, down arrow, up arrow, something like that. There we are. Go up to repositories. Instead of patterns, let's go to repositories, enter, and then tab down, and down arrow to GPDB. And now you can see the RPMs that I installed from that repository. Tab to the right. Now this is a subset of SGI RPMs. That's, uh, USPS doesn't want every little piece of corrupt and junk installed, but I think they're going to Things are changing from the Memphis group to this group. Keep on going down. I want to get you up to speed on building the Fed-centric uh, NVIDIA RPMs. Keep on going down. Keep on going down. So you can see what's installed and what isn't installed. And that's good enough. Tab to cancel. Go ahead and quit, tab to quit. Now I'm curious, do an export uppercase term equals X term. And then go back into YAST. That's more what I like. Now, at the same time, your putty window, what's the size of the putty window? 80 by 26 is what you need to be. If you grab the lower corner, mine usually tells me what size it is. Uh, it's I don't the, know. Oh, there's just up and up. It's at the top left. Yeah. yeah, top left. So get it 80 by 26. One more. 
<laughs> there you go. That's the magic number. If, if you need to keep track of that, Control L, Control L, and that will repaint it. Now I'm not going to go any further today, but I wanted to be able to get into Elilo Editor, and the edit command there. It is critical that it be 80 by 26. Yeah, you can cancel. And then quit, that's fine. I think that's far enough for today, unless there's anything specific you wanted to uh, pursue. No, I want to uh, I want to soak this in. And, uh, sure. And, you, you, know. you can hold the system and try rebooting and playing around and send me email if you get stuck on something and we can regroup. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, and let, let me know when you get this recording, um, because I'll probably sure. go back through it and just kind of mull it yeah. over and soak it in and yeah, formulate okay. some questions. But again, doing is what's going to stick. Absolutely. So anyway, I thought that was far enough, uh, two hours there. That sound good to you? That's perfect. Thank you. And again, uh, you know, I'm not trying to push anything on you, whatever your schedule is, but uh, I, if you like these things, I can... Uh, there's tons of things that we can spend time on as a group. Okay. No, I, have, I have plenty to, plenty to learn. So, uh, yeah, I love the sessions. So I know everyone has schedules and projects and everything, but uh, even if we do two hours a week or something like that, and, uh, I, you know, I've got, by the way, you know, I gave you that DVD. I don't know if you ever looked at it, but there's tons of uh, performance tuning. I create load problems and drill into them and tons of stuff there, too. The DVD is actually worth about thirty grand. Okay, I need to I need to purchase a um, an external USB DVD for my laptop here. Um, sure. That, that way I, uh, I don't have to peel away to to watch those. Or I, I just load it onto my laptop and don't run it off the DVD. Just copy it. And then uh, the top index.html kind of has an expand contract so you can see each of the individual tasks or skills that that particular module covers and stuff. And then we can uh, uh, just keep growing. Again, I'm brain dumping on you here. So no, no, people that's, that's fine. People describe me as drinking from a fire hose, and the way you slow me down is by asking questions. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad I you recorded this. That helps me. Yeah. Uh, that helps, you know, sure. A also, bit. So. I also deliberately repeat myself and make you go through the repetition. So anyway, so let's wrap this up. I'll stop the recording and let you know when the recording's available. And feel free to try rebooting again and see if you can boot off at of SLES 12 instead of SLES 11. That'd be a good task to see if you can do. Okay. Okay? Great. And uh, we'll talk to you later then. All right. Thanks, Dave. Have a nice yep. Day. Yep. Have a good one. Bye.